first every single day. Thank you. That's what today's really all about, and I want to begin with a story. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act. It was the last act he signed before his death. This act reflected his belief that every person deserved to be treated with dignity and respect, and that people with mental illnesses and addictions should be able to receive high quality services in their community, close to home, not just be housed in a hospital or a jail because care wasn't available. Unfortunately, his vision was not realized for decades until now. And now I'd 
rectangular who's someone who understands firsthand the importance of access to behavioral health care. Rochelle Keyes is a leader with the National Alliance on Mental Illness. She lives in Stafford, New Jersey. She has a daughter, Katrina. Seven years ago, at age 15, Katrina suffered a significant mental health crisis and spent time in the hospital. She will share this story. Rochelle wanted to focus on helping her daughter get well. <coughs> Instead, she ended up fighting with an insurance company to get coverage. Thank you, Michelle, for your advocacy and your voice. Please welcome Michelle. Please. <laughs>
Right now, for millions of Americans, mental health care and treatment for substance abuse is out of reach. It's out of reach. In 2020, less than half, less than half of all adults with mental illness diagnosis received care for. Less than half. For children, the numbers are even worse. Nearly 70% of our kids who seek care for mental health or addiction cannot get it. 70%. Talk to parents and teachers. Talk to the school nurses and the counselors. Talk to young people. They'll tell you there's a serious youth mental health crisis happening right now in this country. We must fulfill the promise of true mental health parity for all Americans. Compared to all other, medicals, all other medical specialties. 
As a result, even with private insurance, patients are often forced to seek out-of-network care at significantly higher cost if they can find it. Seeing a therapist can cost 200 bucks a visit or more. That's $800 a month if you have a session every week, which is often what patients need. Many families, significant number of families, cannot afford that. And by the way, think about it, think, think about just how difficult it is to begin with to say, I need help. Break your arm, you have no trouble going there and say, I need help. You're having a mental crisis. It's hard. It's hard to say, I need help. I need help. My child needs help. And this is happening to millions of people. People with insurance are twice as likely to have to go out of network for mental health care compared to physical health care. And that gap has only gotten wider. As a result, folks with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, bipolar disorders, eating disorders, addiction, and other illnesses all can go without care, period. And you know how that ends many times. They try to power through and hope they can manage on their own. Or they pay whatever it takes, spending down their savings, racking up credit card bills, or taking out second or third mortgages get to care for themselves and their children. Folks, it shouldn't be this way. It doesn't need to be this way. I've heard from mental health professionals across the country describing the system that's falling short. One therapist wrote me who primarily treats teenagers, including some who are having suicidal thoughts. And he said, when his patients need to be hospitalized to save their life, insurance companies often deny the claim. Often deny the claim. Another clinical psychologist wrote me and described getting calls from desperate people who call 20 different therapists looking for help but can't find it. This therapist says, and I go, I try to create time that I don't have to see more patients. And I'm I'm often the only person, went on to say, who is able to call them back. I never get calls most of the time. And I personally received letters from family members whose loved ones are suffering from mental illness and describe how difficult it can be to help. One woman wrote me and went on to say about her mother, a retired teacher with a bipolar disorder. Her daughter wrote, quote, too often insurance companies dictate the standard of care when it actually needs to be care providers and family members who have more than the appointment. They say, I can't see you until your doctor submits the paperwork and gets special permission from the insurance company. Give me a break. Now insurance companies, now insurance are going to have to measure how often they require prior authorization and how often they deny those requests. Right now, many health plans don't collect data. Under my administration of the plan, they will be required to collect that data. Yeah. not be treated on par with physical health care, they require by law to fix it. Fix it, fix it. <laughs> when, when Mental Health Priority Act was passed 15 years ago, there was a loophole. Health plans that are offered to state and local government employees did not have to comply with the Mental Health Priority Act. More than 200 health plans nationwide were left out. Now I'm making it clear, they have to follow the law as well. <laughs> the work we've done over the past two years is expanded certified community behavioral health clinics. And I want to thank Debbie again, who for years worked to get this program up and running. She made sure it was funded and the Bipartisan Sugar Communities Act, which I was proud to sign on the law, the largest investment in mental health ever, 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 ever. Thank you. This <laughs> place provided regular service, including crisis support available 24 hours a day and seven days a week, and they serve anyone who needs care, regardless of their ability to pay. 
And now 500 of these clinics in 46 states. We've added more than 140 during my administration. We're going to keep increasing the numbers. We need more than the 500. We've also launched a nationwide crisis outline. Eight, excuse me, 988. Let me say it again. Crisis outline is 988, where you can connect with a trained crisis counselor 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Over 5 million people have called that hotline since they launched it a year ago. 5 million. $1 billion dollars help schools hire, train, and train 14,000 new mental health counselors in schools across the country. And we're taking steps to address the harm social media is doing to our young people, and it is doing harm. The National Experiment they're conducting on, on our children for profit. Later this week, senators will debate legislation to protect kids' privacy online. Which I've been calling for for two years. Matters. Pass it, pass it, pass it. I <laughs> <laughs> really need to think about it. You ever get a chance to look at what your kids are looking at online? Folks, the actions we're announcing today represent a real step forward to help millions of people get mental health care they need, and their insurance should be and, and the insurance should be provided. It should be provided. But there's still so much more to do. Improving our mental health system means addressing the three C's. Coverage, care, and causes. Today, we took a big step in coverage. Now, we need to keep expanding care. For example, by increasing access to telemedicine, expanding our mental health workshop, workforce, doctors, therapists, and counselors, expanding. We need to address prevention and the root cause of the pain and trauma that a lot of people are feeling like the loneliness and isolation, social media and online bullying, gun violence, and they're still, we're still feeling the profound loss of the pandemic in the mental health over 100 people dead. That's 100 empty chairs around the kitchen table. Every single loss, there are so many people left behind and broken heart. <coughs> Folks, this mental health crisis is something we need to face together as a country. We have a moral obligation in mind to be there for each other, to reach out, reach to our neighbor in grief, stress, trauma, and despair, reach out to them, to offer help with just a listening ear. Have the courage to ask for help when we need it, and it's hard. Because we know that even when it feels as dark as it can get, we aren't alone. It's important for people to realize they're not alone. That's what I want everyone. I want everyone in here. Not to feel isolated and lonely. To know their country has their back and their president has their back. Let me close with this. Many people have to seek mental health care at some point in their lives. Whether you're in a red state, a blue state, it doesn't matter. Mental health care can be life changing and even life saving. For all those brave enough and strong enough to seek help, and I mean that. Brave enough and strong enough to seek help. We have to do better. Together, I know we will. Just have to remember who we are, for God's sake. We're the United States of America. I think we do not. There's nothing beyond our capacity. There's nothing. Nothing beyond our capacity we do it together. So God bless you all and may God protect our families. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
President Biden, why were you on calls with your son's partners? 